Yeah. Right. Wearing them a bunch of catfish. Okay, so to begin with, we know the vehicle's HVAC system contains a heater, air distribution, AC, and all of that. And we also know it deals with temperature, air cleanliness, humidity. How does it control humidity? Let's talk about that for a second. How does it? How does the air conditioning AC system control humidity? When you uh, mm -hmm. recycle the cabin air, I imagine it might. Yes and no. That. What happens whenever you're running your air conditioner in the summertime? It gets cooler. <laughs> <laughs> that's a simplistic answer. Uh, but, now, what you're looking at is you're looking at water that's dripping on the pavement. Where does that water come from? Inside the cabin. What happens if you get a good cold glass of tea sitting on your table? Sweat. It's going to sweat. So what you got is if this uh, anything, even under the hood, your accumulator, if you got one of those on there, it's going to sweat. So in the car, the evaporator, because of by virtue of the fact that it's wet, see, and it it actually is going to filter the air a little bit itself. In that that water is going to grab the dust. And hopefully carry it out. But eventually, that evaporator can clog up with dust. You know, if you're not real careful. That's why a cabin air filter is really important. Um, all right. Um, so humidity is controlled because your evaporator gets cold. It sweats. It takes humidity out of the air. Okay, hear me, hear me with this. I asked you this before. Uh, you ever been in a car when you turned on the defrost and it fogged up the windshield? Because Nowadays, the ones that just about every car you've got, if it's got air conditioning on it, when you turn the defroster on, the air conditioner is going to kick on too. And it's going to clear the windshield up really fast. Now, it doesn't always make the air cold because if you've got the heat turned to hot, the air is first going through the evaporator and then it goes through the heater core. And when it, by the time it hits the heater core, it's already dry. So you got warm, dry air, it's going to clear the windshield up real quick. But if you got warm, moist air, you're in worse shape from turning the defrost on than you were before. All right, two technicians are discussing heat movement. Okay, heat is a form of energy, true or false? Yes, true. How many of you know what the first law of thermodynamics is? What? The first law of thermodynamics. Uh, You're going to have to trade something. Oh, yeah, to get something. To get something. you got to have. You got to burn gas to get energy. you got to burn wood to get heat. Right. you got to burn something to get light. And any, time, any energy that you create... And you're, you're going to have to use energy, I mean, use matter to create energy, basically. It's about okay. like matter and energy can't be created or destroyed. Yeah, that's right. You can't destroy or create, you can trade one for the other, basically. Now, and I'll tell you something else, too. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics will be like if I'm, there's a bunch of ways you can illustrate it, but if I heat up a piece of metal, then it's not going to stay hot unless you keep applying heat, is it? Right. It's going to cool off. Everything's going to return to its level. Uh, another way that that is actually expressed is if uh, you spin a bicycle wheel, unless you've got some way of keeping it spinning, when you let go, it's going to slow down and stop. And the law of increasing entropy says that I can put anything out there in the middle of an open field, if it's a nice new car or whatever, and I come back in five years, the tires are going to be flat, batteries are going to be dead, it ain't going to start, brakes are going to be locked up. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Everything's going to go back to where it came from, you see. And ultimately, you know, whenever we get through doing work, you know, the, all the heat will be gone. So every time, the third law of thermodynamics basically said, according to the way I defined it, but I heard it by my own person, is you can't get out of the game. <laughs> you know, you're actually going to be trading something. Every time you trade, like, wood for fire, you're going to lose the wood, right? You're going to get ash, maybe charcoal or something. You lost some of the wood. Uh, when you burn gasoline, how much of the fuel that you burn actually is pu pushing you down the road? You're like 20% efficiency. The rest of it is going out in heat. You know what I mean? So you're, you're, you're going to lose some every time. There is, there is talk about taking the uh, gases out of the air and converting them back into gasoline. <laughs> I mean, if you do it right, they're, talk, they're talking about doing that. It's crazy as all get out. But what if there was a way to um, increase the surface area upon the, uh, the fuel and air and combustion reaction and use less fuel but you get more efficiency from that's, having a higher surface area. That's always they're trying to do something like you're talking about all the time. Direct injection fuel, you know, direct injection gasoline is based on, you know, atomizing it smaller, getting more power out of left gas, all that kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, so technician B says heat travels from hot to cold, and it does. You know, the cold don't travel, heat does. So heat's what's coming and going. Heat intensity refers to which of the following. The heat individuals feel... The, BT, the number of BTU in an area, 
the amount of heat in an area, none of these. BTU. Okay, that, uh, that's going to be a, a dog. That's none of these. D, delta, none of these. Now, what is BTU, by the way? British thermal unit. Yeah, what is, uh, how, would you, how would you describe a British thermal unit? I don't know. You, you go to buy an air conditioner, it's got so many of these things, it can displace so much of it. Okay, yeah. now this is the deal on that. A BTU is the amount of heat that it takes to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. That amount of heat. And if you were to do it in your hand, strike a match. That's a BTU. You know what I'm saying? Got that? Don't forget that. Now, why in the world we're talking about, notice we're talking about a pound of water, British thermal unit. British uses inches and feet and pounds and quarts. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Okay, they even call their money a pound. Right? Yeah. Okay, the freezing point of water is blank on the Celsius scale. Mm. On zero Celsius, degrees. huh? Zero. zero. Okay. Uh, Forty degrees Fahrenheit is equal to what in Celsius? Forty. No. Forty degrees Fahrenheit. No. Is. You got tripped up. Minus forty and minus forty is the same. Forty degrees. Fahrenheit at 40 degrees Celsius, that's where the Celsius and Fahrenheit scales cross, is at 40 degrees. That's where you multiply 40. it or divide mm -hmm. it from uh, 9 over 5 or 5 over 9 or something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's some formulas for that and all, you know, but you subtract 32 and, yeah. and so on and so forth. I mean, that's a formula that, since most of the people that we, that we run through these automotive programs despise math, you know, <laughs> you like math, you're no, good no. at math, don't start with that. You, that's you, 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 one C of heat can increase the temperature of one G of water by one degree F. Wow. Technician B says the temperature will increase one degree Celsius if one C is added. Which technician is correct? Somebody needs to be talking about uh, that there. That there is... This whole statement is based off what a calorie is supposed to be... Uh, how a calorie is supposed to work. Um, calorie. That's calorie, what the yeah, C stands for. Yeah. Little C stands for one. A big C stands for a thousand. They don't tell you that on the. Uh, yeah. And that's different from a food calorie, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Listen to that. Too Woo, much boy, there. Yeah, Sean's got it together, really. Okay. Well, the number seven is going to be B. Number seven is going to be B. Now, see, a lot of this kind of stuff that we teach in air conditioning. Uh, and I had read in Motor, Mobile Air Conditioning Society, there was this guy that writes stuff that, you know, is just really practical. And uh, he says, in electrical, we study Ohm's Law. You know, and uh, we study in the uh, air conditioning, when we're teaching heat transfer, we study the latent heat of vaporization, the latent heat of concentration, all this kind of stuff. He says, the really, really good mechanics that fix the cars, fix electrical systems, fix uh, heat and AC, they don't pay any attention to that hard watch. <laughs> they just fix the car. You see what I'm saying? I'm not saying they don't need to know it. What I'm saying is you're probably not going to use that in the field. It just impresses people whenever you can spit it out. And if you ever go to a school somewhere else, like if you go to and work at a dealership, they're going to send you to various factory schools. And you're going to build on what you do in here. Now, you know, Jimmy, when he went to Ford school, said that the, uh, the stuff that I've got him doing in here made it really easy for him to go through the electrical school. Push, pull, snap, click, he just blew right through it without a problem because he paid attention in here. You see what I mean? The other guys, you know, that had just basically hired off the street or whatever and hadn't really had any real electrical training were just terrified of the electrical stuff. But you just got to relax and understand the principles and, and go for it, you know, anyway. Uh, let's see, boiling point of water 212, technician A, never mind. A number eight, the normal temperature for the average human being is. 98.6. Amount of moisture contained by air is called what? Humidity. Okay, the humidity. In addition to cooling the passenger compartment, an air conditioner system does what? B, it dehumidifies the air. It doesn't heat the passengers. It doesn't put moisture in the air. And it, dirt, it definitely doesn't do all of these. The purpose of air conditioning is to what? Hmm? All of the above. It's supposed to remove moisture, remove dust and pollen, or remove heat. <coughs> Number 12. The main source of heat used to warm the pasture compartment is what? A. 
the vehicle engine. And you know some of the diesel, uh, the little uh, diesels that were come out in the Jeep Liberties, actually had a thing that looked kind of like a power steering pump or something. And because of the diesel doesn't produce heat as fast as a gas burner does, uh, this thing, whenever it would kick in, would produce heat. It was like a heat pump or an air conditioner thing that produced heat and put it in <laughs> and all that. And some of your uh, uh, hybrid vehicles have got little electric grids and stuff that they have to use to help warm up the cabin, you know. If the engine's not running all the time, figure it out, you know. You're going to have to do something, aren't you? Okay, let's look at here. The three states of matter are what? A. Solid, liquid, vapor. At what temperature does steel vaporize? It's got to be up there pretty good, though. At what temperature does steel vaporize? Three thousand degrees. Okay. Now let me hit you with this. Let's say you know, I had a container of water. All right, and I was able to put a thermometer right here above it and a thermometer down in it. And I heated this thing up with a flame until it was boiling. Right? Now, how hot could I get it? How hot could I get this? What, the thermometer? No, the, the water. Without breaking. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just heat it up as hot as I can get it. How hot can I get it? As hot as it will take for us. 212. You're not going to heat it over 212, unless you do one of two things. You put it under pressure, then you get it over 212, or you pour something in it like antifreeze, and then that's going to raise the boiling point. That's at sea level. If you're at Denver, Colorado, which is how high? What's the, what's the altitude of Denver? A mile high. Yeah, it's 5,280 feet, right? That's a mile, right? More or less, 5,000. I mean, it's more or less a mile high. The boiling point of water up there is 160 degrees. Hmm. You boil it up there, it's going to go to 160. Okay, now here I'm going to this. What is the boiling point of refrigerant? The refrigerant, 134A. Where does it boil? You need to know this, Brandon. Uh, yeah, Brandon, why don't you know this, man? Well, Brandon's not dozing off, but I can tell that he's sitting here thinking about what I'm going to do on the weekend, or what I'm going to do with his girlfriend. <laughs> but he's not texting on his phone, and that's encouraging. <laughs> okay, so look, here's what we got. We got negative 21. Negative 21? Yeah, 21 degrees below zero. Now, what was that? Yeah. How? How? Huh? How? What do you mean how? How does it boil it? He says a low boiling. Haven't you ever taken one of these cans of, uh, these dust cans? You know? <laughs> Hold on a second. I think I got one of those in here. stuff right here, and I don't think there's any left in this can, and I'm going to get a can work. This right here basically works the same way a refrigerant does, but it doesn't harm the atmosphere. And this one here ain't got enough in it to do nothing. But if you take that thing and go upside down with it, you can get some liquid out of there. I mean, they can form ice, too. Yeah, it will. But the point is, why does it make ice on your hand? You ever do that? With that stuff, it makes that, it's the same way. It's boiling as soon as it hits your hand. And when it boils, it's absorbing the heat out of your hand. You know what I'm saying? Now, you can take some of that stuff out of that, I don't want them dust cans that you spray, and you can hold it upside down and take a styrofoam coffee cup. And you can spray some of that stuff if it's like R12 used to be. Now, we can't do this legally anymore, but eons ago you could. But you can squirt some of that stuff in a coffee cup, a styrofoam coffee cup, and you can fill that styrofoam, the, the, the heat properties of that styrofoam coffee cup, or so that's it. You can fill that coffee cup half full with that liquid stuff, and it'll stay liquid. And it looks like water. Now, it's not a good idea to leave it sitting around. So if somebody drinks it, and all of a sudden their tongue is, a, you know, crystallized and it breaks off. <laughs> if they swallow any of it, woe to them. You know, you're going to kill them. So don't ever do this and play a joke on anybody. But what you can do is you can take that stuff, put a little piece of paper on top of it, like a little piece of paper, and it'll sit there for several hours. 
still in a liquid state. But as soon as you pour it on anything, it boils. It's like you poured water on a hot skillet. And it's gone. You see? Now, that's not what they would consider a gas that's going to damage the atmosphere, so you can actually do that and, and get away with it, you know, because we're spraying it out here to blunt the dust things off anyway. It's a different kind of chemical. But it would work as a refrigerant. It's basically a refrigerant. You turn that can upside down and spray that, and you get that liquid out of there. Or your, your propane gas. Well, actually, how it frosts everything up, yeah. and the boiling point on that is really low. It's below zero. So what's the melting point on mercury? It's, uh, well, it's actually a liquid. It's in, in, two, this, in this environment, it is. One of two elements. It's naturally yeah. liquid. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong about this. You know, somebody shoot me down if I'm wrong. I think the the boil, I mean, the melting point on mercury, which is a, a metal, is like 270 degrees below zero. It turns into liquid at 270 below. See what I'm saying? It's also very poison, so don't touch it or take it. If it's in your fish, if it's in fish that you eat, you shall surely die. Okay, now number three, the three states of matter: solid, liquid. I'm sorry, 13. Thir uh, solid, liquid, vapor. Technician A says the freezing point of a substance is the temperature at which the substance changes from a solid to a liquid. Uh, what? The freezing point? It changes from a liquid to a solid there, doesn't it? Technician B says the freezing point of a substance is the temperature at which a substance changes from liquid to a solid. That's the melting point. Uh, I'm talking about the melting point is when it changes from a solid to a liquid. The freezing point is when it changes from a liquid to a solid. And so number 14 is going to be a B. Hang with me, guys. We'll be through before we know it. Uh, the measurement, a measurement of the actual weight of water in a given volume of air is? Absolute pressure. Absolute pressure and dew point. Is that right? That's dew point. Yeah. Ah, I'll tell you about dew point. You don't know about dew point? You ever see the dew point on the news? Mm -hmm. um, actually, that's the, the answer to that. Excuse me. That's going to be uh, absolute pressure is going to be the answer to that one. Wait a minute, that, I screwed up on that. <clears throat> Never mind. Relative humidity. Um, I got he got me sidetracked on dew point. I got off uh, track. Here's the dew point. If you look at the uh, weather channel and you see that the dew point is 53 degrees, and you look at the thermometer and the temperature is 53 degrees, you have fog. Now, when the dew point, when the when the temperature raises above the dew point, the fog goes away. Yeah, or if it's below the dew point, the fog goes away. But if the temperature, if the air temperature is the same as the dew point, you know, and that's basically related, you know, humidity and, and barometric pressure, all of that comes together. Because the dew point is not always the same. It's going to change with barometric pressure. So. One time years ago, when I was living in Texas, there was an old Cajun named George Peltier. And there was a hurricane in the Gulf. We were right down there on the coast where I was working. And everybody's worried about what that hurricane was going to do. If you live right on the coast and there's a hurricane out there, especially one that's big and ugly, you're worried about what it's going to do. You know, because you don't want to come out here and blow your roof off your house and all that kind of nonsense. Because if it decides to do that, there's nothing you can do about it except put a new roof on the house. I hope you didn't get killed if it happened. Well, anyway, everybody was sweating bullets about what this hurricane was going to do. And the old Cajun, he was born in like 1902 or something. He says, that hurricane's not coming here. And I said, really? What's he going to do? He said, he's going to turn and go up through northwest Mexico. And I said, well, I'm going to watch that. And this old guy right here, you know, he's been around long enough where he probably ought to know a little something. And it sat out there in the Gulf and got stronger and stronger, and then it turned and went right where he said it was going to go. And I said, how in the world can this old guy, what kind of voodoo magic is he working <laughs> to know where this hurricane is going to go? And so I went to George a little bit later and said, George, how did you know where that hurricane was going to go? He said, oh, I just watched the weather. Wherever the low pressure is is where it's going to go. <laughs> I mean, he was doing it scientifically, and I thought he was, you know, doing some kind of, you know, sprinkling sand out here and burning incense or something. <laughs> <laughs> but he just said, I looked at the areas of low pressure on the map, and that's where the hurricane is going to go, where high pressure is going to stay out. Okay, here's another question. What causes, what causes deserts? Deserts? Yeah. Lack of uh, moisture. Outstanding performance. I understood that. <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. I never mind. Here's, I'm going to say this once, and you guys are going to remember for, for next week's pop test. Got it? Subtropical semi-permanent anticyclones. What? That's what causes <laughs> Subtropical semi-permanent anticyclones. You'll find one sitting over the Mojave Desert. You'll find one sitting over the Sahara. 
that's where they stay. That the high pressure keeps the areas of high pressure air, and it keeps storms and rain out. They don't come in there. You know what I'm saying? That's basically what causes desert. Okay, you guys learned something about climate. Didn't you? Okay, now then, it has nothing to do with carbon dioxide, by the way. The oh, <laughs> deserts have been there for a long time. Uh, the amount of water that could, that air can hold depends on what? Pressure the air temperature. The air temperature. Uh, that's the dew point, you see. One British thermal unit is equal to how many calories? One British thermal unit is equal to how many calories? What do you want? Two fifty-two. Come in here, little young lady. She's bringing me some dishwashing soap. You know what we're going to use this for? I already know. Yeah. <laughs> Wash your hands. No. no. We're going to try to get the oil out of that engine. I mean, out of that cooling system. Okay. We already used up some. That was a mess. All right. Now, um, two tw two fifty two is the right answer to that. Seventeen. Two hundred and fifty two calories per British thermal unit. Okay. Which of the following is true about heat? A. Cold is the lack of heat. B. Heat is a form of energy. All of them. C. Heat always travels from something warm to something cold, and all of those are true. Number 19, a burning kitchen match gives off how many calories? 252. 252 is what I told you earlier. Burning kitchen match equals bridge thermogen. Number 20, many late model vehicles use a blank to help clean the air in the vehicle. Cabin, Cabin air filter. Yeah. Okay. Now, Judy uh, McClaney would come over here with this uh, Pontiac Montana she had, and what would happen with that darn thing is she would wind up. Uh, Having a, um, air airflow would be lousy, and um, so I would say, well, if the airflow is lousy, let's look at the cabin air filters. On that one, you pull the glove box down, and you reach in there and you pull out those cabin air filters. There's two of them. You pull one out, and then you slide the other one, and you pull it out. And they'd be so clogged up with leaves and dirt, then you get new ones from the parts house and cram them in there. And all of a sudden, she's got good air now. Now there is a Buick. The 99 Buick, the one with a supercharger on it, mm -hmm. they had that stupid pulley that had a left-hand thread bolt, and the, and the book said nothing about it, and we stripped out the threads and had to fix that. And all. Well, there was no reason for it to be left-hand thread, because the belt, I mean, the bolt was turning, the, the, the pulley was turning in the direction that it should have tightened the bolt, not loosened it, if it was right-hand thread. And so Tyler's over here trying to take the doggone thing off, and you look in the book, and it just says, take the bolt out and pull the thing off. And he's really grunting and straining on that thing, and he's just screwed in aluminum, and he can't get it to move. But when it finally does move, it won't come out. It's just turning around and around and around. <laughs> so anyway, when we, I said, well, so anyway, he had, to, he had to snap to turn it the other way, and he got it out of there. And doggone if it didn't have left-hand thread on it. And I was thinking, why did they put left-hand thread on this thing? I mean, I'm thinking, wait a minute, the pulley, if the pulley, remember what I told you, if the pulley has grooves, it's turning the same direction as the engine. If the pulley is flat, it's turning the opposite direction because the back of the belt's driving it, right? Okay, so if it had been a flat pulley, I could have understood that because it would be prone to screw the bolt out, you see. But on that one, it's turned into the clockwise direction, but they put a left-hand thread bolt in it and didn't tell us about it. Mr. Semester was that last semester? Yeah, that know. white Buick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we, that, we fought with that darn thing. We had yeah. to put a helical in there, but I got to thinking... Why do I need a left-hand thread helicoil? Because, you know, you could buy one, uh, 10 yeah. millimeter, one and a half thread fish, left-hand thread helicoil. The kit was $200. I said, I'll never use that again. I ain't going to buy that. we just go ahead and put a right-hand thread helicoil in there because it's going to be okay. It's not, it's not going to screw out of there. You know, but anyway, we did that. That was on view of the supercharger. Huh? Yeah, that supercharger oh, uh, pulley was the one. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that view of the supercharger. It doesn't have an air cooler, but it's got a supercharger. Isn't that strange? Okay, now, uh, if you can do that, but uh, the long and the short of it was, um, I even told, I even said that if you ever, uh, to go on record here, 99 Buick, 3.8, supercharged, that pulley that's all the way to the front, that's closest to the radiator, that's on the belt that drives the supercharger, remember, if you ever have to change that pulley, that son of a gun is left, it's an idler. It's not, it's left-hand thread. So you got to turn it to the right. Actual pulley on the got, Huh? The no, the pull, it's an idler pulley that the belt goes around. Oh, okay. It's the farthest forward. 
you know. But I mean, the fully owned supercharger and all that stuff, you know, you'd expect crazy stuff there. But not on this to plan a while. I learned it had grooves in it. You know, looking at the pulley, even if you're thinking about it like a mechanic, you'd say, well, this pulley turns clockwise when I'm looking at the pulley, so there would be no reason for them to put left-hand threads because that might screw the bolt out if the bearing ever locked up. You know, anyway, that was, I got, that was a smackdown. But that particular car, you know, I was still telling you about that because of the heat and air conditioning thing. Uh, there's no heat. Oh, yeah, I had a Chinese camera. Yeah, well, not, yeah, we did that, but the, it, it still doesn't have heat worth a tooth. And it's similar to what you got going on with yours. And so we're going to have to get around to that, too. But in the meantime, uh, everybody that's working on big, solid, heavy duty, you notice I didn't throw you a bunch of worksheets this week because everybody's up to here. Everybody's standing on their head and the work that we got to get done. Uh, you, you stand a good chance of getting that car. Whatever happens, we're going to figure out a way to get the thermostat out and back on our work won't leak, even though that gasket ain't worth a toot. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the gasket, they sent us a gasket for that, the Felpro gasket, I mean, the Felpro O ring is incompatible with the thermostat housing. The stupid uh, slot they cut for the O ring is too deep for the gasket. You drop the gasket in there, it goes out of sight. I mean, you know, it's the right diameter, but it goes slammed down in there where we ain't going to touch. Anyway, long and short of it, we're going to, you know, y'all hammer on what you already got going on.